Hi, my name is Zach Kramer. I work on the Azure Government Engineering Team, and we have with us today Matt Rathbun, our CISO for Azure Government. Uh, so, Matt, thanks for coming. And today we want to talk a little bit about compliance and uh, what our approach to compliance is for Azure Government. And so, we thought we'd kick it off with an easy one. How many compliance regimes does Azure cover? Well, thanks, Zach. Uh, and thanks for having me here. I'm excited to, to participate. We have 58 different compliance regimes that we comply with. Wow. So, 50, we say regime because some of them are actual full authorizations or certifications from independent bodies. Okay. Some are independent commercial organizations that work with us and evaluate our compliance, and then some are individual attestations that we've done through our own internal processes. That's great. So that is a lot of logos and a lot of compliance, I can imagine. So one of the things we wanted to do was go ahead and drill into Azure government specifically. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the compliance offerings that are particular to Azure government. Yep, absolutely. So from an Azure government perspective, we're obviously focused on US related specific things. Okay. So we have FedRAMP compliance at the highest level, so FedRAMP high impact. Okay. We can also cover moderate impact and low impact if the customer wants to use those. In the defense space, we comply with both DOD L4, IL4 for our entire Azure government offering. And then we have specific dedicated regions that are for that IL5 where we need the physically isolated uh, secure compute and uh, networking processes. Okay for the individual organizations. We can then comply with CGIS requirements if you have federal law enforcement data. We have uh, IRS compliance if you have federal tax information. We can do HIPAA compliance if you have healthcare data. And in fact, the VA just launched a big application managing PHI, so health information in the cloud. Okay. Lots of different operations. Yeah, so, so I think that's a great segue in. So I come from an app development background. I've built apps before and now work on Azure government. And one of the things that I think about is when I, I learned about some of the compliance stuff that we're doing, is you have to think about the data. So what kinds of data do we have? And for instance, like one of them, you know, I heard CUI being tossed around. Is that something we can support? What is that? What, what do these mean? Absolutely. CUI is a, a data type that we support. It stands for controlled unclassified information. Okay. It's essentially any government information that is both unclassified and not public. Okay. So you know, your public info websites from the US government, that's not CUI. It's intended for public consumption. And classified stuff that the military might be getting into, that's also not CUI because okay. that's intended for classified resources. Everything else is in the middle. So the CUI is actually, it's a label defined by the, the National Archives. Okay. So it's a NARA regulation, and it's effectively all government information for the most part. So we can handle that both through our FedRAMP uh, implementations and our DOD implementations. Uh, we also talked about in the last time, so CGIS data. So that's okay. law enforcement data that comes from the FBI. It's called so CJI, criminal justice information. It's like criminal records, maybe... Uh, is my speeding tickets in there? I mean, not that I've got a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so speeding tickets wouldn't be. It's okay. only data that comes from the FBI. From the FBI, okay. And unless you're getting a speeding ticket from the FBI somehow, <laughs> that's not going to be relevant information. But it is anything else, so it's personally identifiable information and criminal history information okay. uh, about law enforcement individuals in dealing with, uh, so either people who are law enforcement personnel themselves or uh, people who have come on the wrong side of the law enforcement <laughs> equation yes. and, and data about those individuals. Okay. Um, we can deal with healthcare data. So okay. PHI data, uh, we can deal with federal tax information. Okay. So if you have to, uh, IRS data, so both tax data and then also certain types of healthcare data now are also considered taxable information. Ah, okay. And so we can handle all of those types of information as well. Okay. And then for the for the DoD, we were talking about they. You mentioned impact level four and five data. So that. What, what does that cover for DoD people? Sure. So a uh, couple of different things where we're going to talk about. That's still CUI. It's controlled and classified, okay. although sometimes it has DCUI applied, the being for defense, defense okay. controlled and classified information. So level four is for CUI that is not national security sensitive. Okay. Level five is for CUI that is national security sensitive. Okay. Another important piece, though, is also for DCU. We have individuals who are not necessarily government first party organizations organizations, but are doing work on behalf of those organizations. Okay. We also have DFARS compliance. So if you okay. have to comply with the defense federal acquisitions rules and regulations, then that is also available inside of Azure government. Okay, so the way I can kind of think about this is if from a law enforcement perspective, if I'm building systems for law enforcement, if I am law enforcement or I'm in any way interfacing with their data, Azure government can hold their data yep. and can handle that. And for the Department of Defense, you know, again, if I'm building things for the Department of Defense, researching things for the Department of Defense, or I am the Department of Defense with data, I can, Azure government can hold that data. Yep, including export controlled, so uh, okay. arms regulations and trafficking, so weapon system designs and things like that, okay. could still be held. Effectively, 
anything that is government data yeah. that is unclassified, okay. we have the standard necessary to hold that in Azure government. So now we can basically, you know, thinking about it from an application developer perspective, I can decide on a cloud provider based on what accreditations they have. And we looked at that list of logos. Azure's got most of them. Uh, we got you covered there. But then I have to go uh, build my application with actual services in the cloud. So are the services all compliant by default, or kind of what, how does that work, and how does that work even with some, when I'm looking at evaluating kind of clouds that I might choose? Sure, absolutely. That's actually a very, very important question, because it's one thing for me to just have a, a certification, but if they have that for one service, yeah. and that's not the service you need, it doesn't necessarily do you any good. Okay. And it does require us to have it for each individual unique service offering that we have for customers. Okay. So in Azure overall, we have about 80, close to 80 customer-facing services. Okay. In Azure government today, we have 42 deployed customer-facing services. Okay. So not the entire fleet, but a large, large uh, section, yeah. and we're, we're adding to that every single day. Okay. Of those, 32 are currently certified at the FedRAMP High and DOD Level 4 okay. um, impact level, so we can host those. Another seven are already submitted and, and waiting government evaluation, and we anticipate those here in mid-June sort of time frame, yeah. ability to add those additional seven to our certification pipeline or to our overall compliant package with inside the Azure government environment. Another question I have is, so are we waiting, um, a lot of things I've seen, and when I had done some compliance work before, you know, there was kind of like annual review cycles or things like that. Are we waiting on these annual review cycles, or are we able to get things in faster? Yeah, so we don't wait on annual review cycles. Okay. When, when we did, when the programs were initially stood up, and once every year we would add something, the average time to add a system was 18 months. Yeah. So I could get something deployed, th theoretically a customer could use it, but it wasn't certified to be used. And right. it took 18 months to get through the paperwork process. Yeah. Now, we worked really closely with the regulators at both FedRAMP and the DOD, and we've pulled that down into 60 days. Right. And the most of that 60 days is actually just time for me to get inventory data to replicate and to produce scan information. Okay. The regulator's piece is down to as little as two weeks. That's so by the time something's deployed, it's in my inventory, and I have continuous monitoring data for it. Yeah. It only takes the regulator, so FedRAMP or, or DOD, about two weeks to say, yes, this is good, we can go ahead and move it in. So radically accelerating that time frame. And we helped develop that standard that is now available to any cloud provider. That's fantastic. So we're making it better. Now, OK, so I've chosen a cloud. I've got my services. Now I need to get my app compliant. Okay. So is, are there things, how, do you, how does Azure help with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Before joining Microsoft, I came from a world where I was a 3PAO yep. and had to help people okay. uh, build compliance with these scenarios. Glad you're here. <laughs> One of the first things I did when I came to Microsoft is said, uh, we need a program to help with that because it's just too expensive and cumbersome for smaller application providers. And then we found out, actually, even for individual agencies within federal entities to do this themselves. So we developed a program we call Azure Blueprint. Okay. It has five major pillars. Okay. Initially, we published our architecture of exactly how all of our services work. And then we say, for those services, here's where a customer has responsibility, and here's where Microsoft has responsibility. Okay. In cloud, it's always sort of shared. So I can't, for example, control how they do their application code development. Right. That's always going to be their responsibility. But I re maintain the code for my underlying space. But I can take completely away from them physical security requirements. Right. If they architect on top of platform as a service, I can take away completely maintaining that underlying operating system architecture. So if you're using SQL, for example, as a service, as opposed to running it on IaaS and maintaining your own licenses and things like that, you don't have to worry about patching or maintenance of those servers. We do that entirely for you. Okay. All of that's documented and available. We then say, OK, the piece of things that are available to a customer that they're responsible for, yeah. we're working on developing a catalog of automated deployment templates where we automate as much of that as possible. Okay. So it's about 50% of the things that an individual customer is going to be required to do. That's things like enforcing encryption, setting up the correct kind of monitoring, putting firewalls in place. All of the normal stuff that these regulations require, we will automate them. You will just be able to push one button and get an environment that already complies with that okay. set of standards. Meaning the only things that are left over for the mission owner are that process sort of stuff like performing my SDL, controlling my user access to that environment. Yeah, how do my code reviews happen? Yeah. How does, yeah, exactly. I add a user, yeah. Another huge part of this compliance uh, framework, though, is the paperwork side. So our package, as an example, is about 4,000 pages long. Yeah, I've seen it printed uh, out once. It was quite <laughs> epic. <laughs> we want to we keep customers from having to do the exact yeah. same thing. So we took that package, for example, in a FedRAMP space and said, actually, we're going to rewrite it entirely. It's not going to be how Microsoft meets Microsoft's obligations. It's what Azure does automatically for our customers 
on their behalf. So in that original architecture where we said we had responsibility, we've now written regulatory paperwork for you that explains that at the appropriate level of detail for the regulator. And then where we still say you have responsibility, we talk about what architecture is necessary to meet that responsibility, yeah. what a passing answer looks like. Essentially, we've created a paint by numbers to accelerate getting organizations through this overall process. We then have expertise, yep. So, and it comes in two different flavors. We pay an unbelievable amount of money that I won't say live on camera <laughs> uh, to our uh, subject matter experts and auditors. It's yeah. a very, very high bill. Uh, if our customers want to have access to those same organizations that already know Azure inside and out and not have to pay uh, normal street rates, mm -hmm. they can get access to our volume discount by coming through the Azure Blueprint program. Okay. Also means okay. they get the customer service as if they were spending $10 million a year and not $10,000 a year. Yeah. The other thing is we have full-time staff who's their, their day job, all they do is help do security architecture reviews, compliance reviews for our customers. So if you're building an application and you're not sure how to meet a particular challenge, well, we've already done that for our 80 customer-facing services we build on top of our own architecture. We've also helped 160 organizations around the planet solve these same engineering challenges. We can help our customers do that too. So if you're developing an application and you're not sure how to meet it, we can help. If you've built something that's compliant but you can't figure out how to explain to your uh, internal reviewers that it is compliant, your IA folks that it is good. We will also meet with you and them on your behalf to talk about how what you have done is already what they've approved for our platform and sort of grease those skids, make it a lot easier. Overall, we tested this program in the federal government. Mm -hmm. We've seen a reduction in time to certify an entire platform the size of Azure by over 50%. Wow. We've seen the time reduced to uh, deploy a specific application to as little as six weeks. Uh, and we're trying to tighten that further down. Now, if I can get a new service added in two weeks, we should be able to do the same thing for an individual application. In fact, our goal is to get down to 24 hours yeah. that an application wow. can, be, can be certified when they build on top of our, our architecture. That's and when we've seen a reduction in cost by up to 73% wow. going through these certification processes using the Blueprint program. All okay. right, so I am, I'm definitely sold. I know the guys that do, the, uh, <laughs> that do your compliance help, and they are great, and it really has been a lot. I've seen a lot of customers that have, have been helped with that. So, Okay, so we've, we've chosen a cloud. We have uh, uh, picked our services. We can now do compliance. So we, we really kind of have an end-to-end -end picture around compliance. Um, the one thing we wanted to do is pivot a little bit. And in all this context, we wanted to talk about, on May 11th, there was the cybersecurity uh, executive order that came out looking at um, lots of different pieces. So can you share kind of your thoughts on that and what you're seeing with customers and how, how they're thinking about it? Sure. So the cybersecurity executive order is very important, especially for our federal customers or anybody who's in the uh, defense supply chain. Everybody okay. in both, either of those camps needs to think about this. So People that make things that go boom, basically. <laughs> or make anything, any part of the supply chain for the DoD, okay. right? But definitely things that go boom <laughs> would need to be thinking about this. Those organizations have to now not just think about the FedRAMP sort of compliance that we talked about okay. and the, the DoD compliance, but also the NIST critical infrastructure cybersecurity framework, which okay. is a new sort of way of thinking about it. It moves us away from specific controls to more objective-based. It's a maturity-related model uh -huh. uh, where we think through those sorts of things. And the executive order really sort of gives three directives uh, to these agency heads and organizations. The first is they need to prefer the acquisition or the, the procurement of shared services for email, cloud, and cybersecurity. Okay. Right? The reason why is it's very hard to do those things well small. There's all sorts of huge advantages by going large scale. Yeah. So Microsoft, we spend a billion dollars a year on our cybersecurity. We have thousands of engineers working on this problem every single day. Yep. Almost impossible to replicate on-premises, almost impossible for even federal organizations to replicate. They can take advantage of those scalar things we've done to manage millions of hosts around the world yep. for their own applications without having to reinvest that same uh, set of dollars. The next thing that it says you have to do is produce a risk assessment versus that new cybersecurity framework. So the individual application owners may know where they're at relative to FISMA or DOD guidelines, but now we have to rethink about that in the cybersecurity framework standpoint. And then they have to produce a plan also within that same 90 days for how they're going to comply, okay. how they're going to meet the cybersecurity framework. So Microsoft's leaning in really heavily here. Okay. We're, we're going to be publishing throughout that 90-day reporting period every single week uh, new content, new help, new feedback, including everything. We've already published a couple pieces of guidance. So we published that, that responsibility idea that we talked about in architecture for the CFS 
stuff specifically. So where an application owner has responsibility versus where Azure has responsibility for you. We published our attestation. Even though we weren't required to go get one, there's no official compliance, we had our independent auditor evaluate our framework, all of our services that are in scope for FedRAMP, and say all of these meet the CSF requirements. So use of these is going to help a customer comply with their CSF requirements. Uh, platform as a service is also a big change. The number one risk cited in the executive order is failure to solve or to patch or fix known vulnerabilities. So these are things that we knew about like WannaCrypt. We knew for two months yeah. about that vulnerability, yet still hundreds of millions of systems around the world were compromised. Right. So if you architect on a PaaS environment, you get to offshoot that risk. All of that goes away. Maintaining an evergreen environment, staying on current hardware, staying constantly patched is all taken care of for you when you're working with PaaS and SaaS. So the value proposition is not just about moving to shared services, but it's really thinking about the right shared service and how do I use this as an opportunity to do some IT modernization, potentially get some additional budget. One of the things you're supposed to outline in risk is where you've had to accept risk because you didn't have the budget to do modernization. This is a chance to use that plan to get some additional funds to really be able to modernize government uh, offerings and, and solutions and bring us into uh, a less risky world where those big scalar advantages of the shared services are taking care of some of this uh, for the individual organization. Yeah, that makes sense. I think yeah, the, the point on PaaS is super relevant and something that I've thought a lot about as we look at how do we you know, just remove classes of problems, right? So yep. not only does it make your compliance easier, you're just removing the class of problems. I don't have to build the best patch management system in the world. I just don't patch. Right. It's done for me. The problem is gone. So I think that's great. Okay, well, I want to say thank you for coming out and talking to us. I think this is great to look at a summary of overview of our stuff. So thank you very much, and thank you for watching. <laughs>